Amen. Good morning. I used to be a kid. Black. All right. I don't know if I put these glasses on. They don't really have much. How many kids do we have here today? One. If you're under the age of 20, <laughs> well, you stand because you got good knees. <laughs> Under the age of 20, stand up for us. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Under the age, come on. Oh, yeah. How about that? Let's give these kids a hand. <laughs> Thank you, you to be seated. Yeah, like I said, I used to be under 20 as well. All right. Been a minute, been a while. Um, I am very grateful to have had a good Christian upbringing. My, my home and family was very much a dedicated Christian home and family. And uh, even though I uh, tried to ignore it and tried to run and tried to just not have anything to do with it, there's something about, uh, there's something about the prayers and the lifestyle of a Christian family that will uh, follow you around. You know, you'll say and you can run but you can't hide. That's the point right there. Stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, please, this morning. We're looking at two passages of Scripture today. And our topic is uh, train up a child. We've all heard this verse. We, we just love it to pieces, okay? And we're going to talk about that this morning. So we get ready to send our kids off to church camp uh, tomorrow morning. Proverbs 22, verse number 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. All right? There's your commandment. There's your principle. Train up a child in the way he should go. And here's the promise. And when he is old, what? He will not depart from it. Because you can run, but you can't hide. All right? Our other passage is from the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, God told his people this about, uh, about the word of God, about the law particularly, what we should do. And he said, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Uh, just your head, but in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That's how saturated we're supposed to be with the Word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. Holy and blessed name again for this blessed and beautiful day. We pray, Lord God, today that you'll visit us with your Holy Spirit, with your presence, that you'll speak to our hearts, Lord, and uh, help us to listen, to open our hearts, and to pay attention to what the Lord God would say to us. Lord, we thank you for the young people. We thank you for those for the young at heart, and we thank you for the Christian heritage and the legacy that we have that reaches all the way back to you, dear God. We ask your blessings on our time together and again on those who are unable to be here today. Remember all our special prayer requests. We love you. We thank you. We bless your holy name. And I ask now that you would fill me with your spirit to bring this message for your honor and for your glory. In the magnificent and almighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, we all pray. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. Did you have a Christian upbringing? Did you? I did good for me. Uh, I went to church all the time. Sometimes there wasn't even church going on. But we went anyway. You know? You, you heard about the people that the, the, every time the doors were open, that they went to church. Well, we were the people that went and opened the doors. <laughs> so we could go there. Now, when, uh, when I was a, a wee lad, when I went to, to church as a boy, uh, we had electricity but no running water. No indoor plumbing. There was a little little house down the hill. Okay? There's no indoor plumbing. No air conditioning. Funeral home fans. Right? Long-winded preacher. Okay? And uh, no such thing as we had well we had we had vacation Bible school one time when I was a boy. I made a match stick cross. We, uh, no such thing as uh, youth group. No such thing as uh, Wednesday night kids. Uh, didn't have Sunday school. And uh, there's no church camp. There's none of that. We just were just a, a handful of folk up in the hills. And that's all we could come up with. So it's pretty rough. So my earliest memories of church are not all that pleasant. Okay? 
But I, I can still remember sitting in Miss Ruby's car class. And it was, it was on stage behind the pulpit because, you know, there's not a bunch of rooms in these little country churches. And uh, we, we go to Miss Ruby's card class, and Miss Faye's little class, and they hand us out these little, this little pamphlets with picture of David and Goliath and Jesus and all these things. And I, but to this very day, I still remember some of those earliest lessons that I learned as just a little boy in church. When I was only this tall, I, my, my, my preacher, the, our pastor stood me up on the pulpit, and I quoted the 23rd Psalm. I don't remember it, but mom said I did, so who am I to argue with mom, right? This is the kind of a heritage that I grew up with. Now, it still took me until I was 21 years old to ever accept Christ as my Savior, okay? All right? So it's not like, well, I mean, you were just hatched out in a situation. You didn't have any choice. Oh, I had a choice, and I made my choice, and I wasn't going to let anybody tell me what to do, and that including God. But you can run, you can't hide, okay? We're in, train up a child in the way he should go when he's old he will not depart from it and God says I want you to put this all over your house I want you to talk about it and you just do all these things because it's very very important it is important today that our children have a religious education that they have a fundamental foundational understanding of what we believe as Christians they need a Christian world view it is extremely extremely important now, where are you going to get such a thing as a Christian worldview? How, where are you going to find a place that you can trust that's going to raise up, raise up your children to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, there's two places. Number one is in your home and in your family. That's where it begins. That's, that's where the primary responsibility is. Parents and grandparents and other folk, it is your responsibility to see to the religious education of your children. It's your primary duty. Now, the other place is in a good church where, uh, where we, we do have, well, I'm proud of this too. We've got Sunday school. We've got children's church. We've got Wednesday night kids. we got, uh, uh, what am I missing? We've got church camp coming up tomorrow. Hopefully next year we'll have you have vacation Bible school as well. This is a bit much this year, but we want to get back to these things. And so we take a lot of time and money and resources and effort and attention to try to build a foundation of faith onto, into the hearts and souls and lives of our younger generation, of our kids, because it's vitally, vitally important. And the idea that God has given us here is that families and churches become a team, that we work together, because when you, when you come to class, when you go to Wednesday nights, or you go to children's church, or whatever, guess who you're going to see there? You're going to see the adults that go here who are trying to do the same thing, in their homes and in their families. So we're, we're all in this together. We really are. And one of the great blessings of a good church is this, that you'll not find another group on the planet that is more interested in your kids, that is more for you as a family, that is any more supportive and encouraging to the way that you and your children are doing and how y'all go. There, there's nobody like that 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 than your home church where you walk in here on Sunday morning, you see these people, and you know that they care about you, and you know they care about your kids, and we're willing to put resources and effort into helping you raise up good and godly Christian children. This is a blessing from God. Do not take it for granted. It is vitally important that your kids have a foundation of faith. I do not understand, I cannot understand adults who claim to be Christians but do not, do not make certain that their children are raised up with a, a, a fundamental foundational understanding and knowledge of a Christian world view, view of what the Bible says. Uh, it, was, it was bad enough back in the 60s when I went to school, okay, for, for, for people to be able to withstand the, the onslaught of the world against a, a young, delicate psyche and faith and these things. And it's that much more worse today. If you were raised as a Christian, I want you to try to imagine how important it was for you to know that there were some people praying for you on a regular basis. Can you think of some folks? Can you think of somebody that prayed for you all the time when you were young? Well, I sure can. Wait, can you can you think of some people who helped lay that, that godly foundation 
When you were, when you, were you adults, when you were young and in school, did you ever call on the name of the Lord? Did you ever pray? Were you ever aware that, that you know, that, that Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world? That, that Jesus loves me this, I know, for the Bible tells me so. Did you know these things? Did you have a, a basic, fundamental understanding of the truths of the Bible and God and Jesus and salvation and prayer and angels and the devil and all these things? Did you have that when you went to school? I didn't. How many of you had that when you were kids? A, a fundamental understanding of Christianity. There you go. I want you to imagine what it would be like if you went to school and you had no understanding, no knowledge that you couldn't name a single person on earth that prayed for you that you didn't have any clue what, what, who God was or which God was the real God and what Jesus was all about and what the church was all about that you didn't have any of that behind you. Listen, I, I do not want to go anywhere without a sense of the faith that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you? Hmm? I don't want to live a day without somebody praying for me because I need it. How many of you need prayer every day? Say amen. Amen. I need to pray every day, but you need to pray for me every day, okay? We're all in this together, and we need this. What would you, as a Christian here today, what, how would you feel if all of a sudden God says, you know what, never mind. Change my mind. I'm going to take the Holy Spirit back out of you. I'm going to throw the Bible away. Just ignore it. It doesn't work anymore. No angels for you. No Jesus about you. You're on your own. Good luck. How would you face life tomorrow? With zero Jesus. No faith. Hmm? I'd crawl up under the bed, I think, and stay there, wouldn't you? I don't want to face this world without faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I need it. I need it desperately. And we all do. And so do our kids. It's vitally important that we that we do this together. Now, our, kid, our kids don't have to know everything there is about the Bible. I mean, I don't know everything about, there is about the Bible. But the basic fundamentals, because the child needs to be able to go to school and be able to call on the name of the Lord, whether anybody hears them or not. A child needs to be able to go to school, whether they're little or whether they're teenagers or anywhere in between. They need to be able to, to, to know that they have a faith in the Lord, that Jesus is always with them, the Holy Spirit is within them, the angels are there whether they're invited to school or not, that the name of Jesus and the power, presence and power of God has, it, it is yours no matter their circumstances, has nothing to do with school policy or who your teachers are or, or, or what state of the union you live in or any of these things, that you know that you know because you have been taught from a child that there is a God, there's a heaven, there's a hell, there's a Jesus, there's a Holy Spirit, there are angels, and God gave his promises to you to there you go. And this, 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 early, this early Christian foundation for a child is vitally important because not only does it, does it help you in the moment, all right, that you, you're able to whisper a prayer, as the song says, right in the middle, I want to say, uh, in the middle of algebra class, you'd be whispering a prayer, amen? They get that pop quiz, well, better pray, okay? And we, so we're going to pray in school whether they know about it or not. Because we believe in prayer. We believe on calling on the name of the Lord. And there are dangers in school these days. Amen? And I, we won't even talk about all that. But we know that, that we want the Holy Spirit. We want the name of Jesus and the presence of God to go with our kids to school. Come back with our kids from school. And wherever else that they might go. We want to know that our children also have, know how to call on the name of the Lord. And how to have faith in God. And to trust the Lord. And to quote a few verses of scriptures. And to build their own faith. Because mom and dad can't always go with them and protect them from things. Amen? And it, become, it eventually comes a point where every person has to have their own faith. Their own faith. You can't ride on the coattails of mom and dad or, or your Sunday school teacher or anybody else. Eventually, it has to be your faith. And that's why we try to teach them uh, down up here from the starting at, at, the, at the bed babies, right? In the nursery. Starting at the bed babies and all the way up. So this is our job. This is our joy, what we're trying to do. Now, it's important. It's important that we do these things for these kids because, uh, well, here's a few things. First of all, when a child reaches the age of accountability, you, you, know, you adults know what that means, right? The age of accountability, well, it means that you are, you are spiritually and emotionally and, and uh, psychologically mature enough that God says, okay, now you're ready to be uh, held accountable for your own actions, your relationship with God. So that when a child gets to that age, 
and, the, and, and someone tries to tell them the gospel, you don't have to start with, well, first of all, there is a God, and uh, there's a God that is the God of the Bible, and uh, we see him as three people, but we see the Son, and you don't have to start at all that because the kid already knows. God, Bible, Jesus, cross, resurrection, oh, he's born on Christmas and, and died and rose again on Easter. And we get the basic fundamentals there so that you don't have to start from square one when you get old enough to understand your responsibility for God. We want that for our children. We want them to have all the tools, all the information that they need so that they, make, they can make a, a rational, logical, spiritual decision. So you know what? I'm going to take that Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And they pray that sweet, simple prayer when God makes them a child of God. And they never come unborn from the family of God. Now they've got the Lord Jesus Christ. They've got the Holy Spirit within them. All the rest of the days of their life. Is there anything better than that? Than having Jesus Christ in the heart of your children? There's not. There isn't. So we want to prepare for that. So we want, we want to see your kids say, we're sending off 29 kids and five counselors tomorrow, going to church camp tomorrow. We, we, want, to hear, we want to hear some of that ringing that bell. Amen? You know what that means? When you come to know Jesus up there in church camp, you go ring that bell. Somebody puts it on their phone and it's all over Facebook. And when that happens, we all are going to shout hallelujah. Okay? Because that's, that's some good news. That's some good, good stuff. Another reason why this is important for our kids at, at this age is, again, because they need to be able to call on the name of the Lord wherever they are, whatever's going on. They need to know that God's got them. They need to have that, well, what the Bible calls a childlike faith. Sometimes it puts the rest of us to shame because it simply is. Well, God said it in His Bible, therefore it must be true. Let's just act like it. Okay, a simple faith that kids can have and adults can have as well. Later on in their life, later on in their life, Having a fundamental foundation for their faith that they get from their home and family and from the church they attend is vitally, vitally important. Once they get out of high school, you know, once, once our kids get a, a job and a car, right? Bye. We'll see them a little bit. And once they go off to college, once they go off to work or whatever, once they move out. Now, our ability to protect them is limited. And what happens is that our kids get out there and they discover that going to going out in the world is not like going to church anymore. Right? It's different out there. First of all, there the world at, at large is an unbelieving world. We do not live in a Christian world. We're Christians in an unbelieving world. And it is really important that we have a a Christian worldview that we've developed over the years from the time we were little. That we'll, that because of our, our teaching and training as children, as young adults or whatever, that we see the world the way God says it really is. There is right and there is wrong. There is good and there is evil. This is the way you treat people. This is the way you don't treat people. And I want you to think about all the different, the, what, what the, the characteristics that we like to see in human beings, in our kids especially. We want to see our, our kids, our grandkids, and people in general. We want to see them uh, be honest. We want to see them be loyal. We want to see them work hard, okay? We want to see them do well. We want them to be people of compassion, people of morality, people of courage, okay? People of faith. We want to see our kids grow up to, to value other people and treat them with respect, treat them in a decent, decent manner to care about what happens to other people, to be the very best person that they can, personal development, all the other things. And what we realize, all that stems and comes from the very character of the Lord Jesus Christ. That these are attributes that God has given us. And as families and as churches, it's our, it's our joy to, to come alongside uh, our kids and, and to train them up in this so that when they do go out in the world and they're on their own, little birds got to leave the nest, right? Okay. That's, that's a two-edged sword. You're 35. Yeah, you got to leave the nest, all right? Time to get out. But anyway, we want them to leave the nest, and we want them to be able to face that world out there. Because the world doesn't believe what you believe. The world don't believe that. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in right and wrong. They don't, they don't believe in Adam and Eve. They don't believe in all these things. And so what you'll find is that all of a sudden, you're a minority. And minority believers and a majority of an unbelieving world. And that's a shock. The other thing you'll under, run into is the fact 
that there is an enormous amount of peer pressure for a Christian child that is unbelieving peer pressure. And the things that kids do, and the temptations that they face, and it and it's, it's there's a there's a squelching of your faith. Okay? Now you might have prayed for let's say you you prayed over your meal for ten for the last ten years. But you go out with your buddies in college or down at the job or whatever, and you have to break out your sandwiches or you go to a restaurant, what happens then? You gonna pray? Probably not. It's negative peer pressure in terms of Christianity. But not only that, but there there is a remember that that the Bible says that the the Antichrist isn't here, but the Bible says that the spirit of Antichrist is already working the world. That not only it's not like the world just don't care. Well, you want to be Christian? It's fine. The world does care because there's there's plenty of anti-Christian sentiment in the world today. There is as much there's as much persecution of Christians in the world today as there's ever been. You just don't hear about it. Christians are persecuted for their faith. You just don't hear about it very much. And it's, it's not just that nobody cares whether you go to church or not, or whether you pray in public, or whether you claim to know Jesus. They do care, they don't, and they want you to not do that. And so the Bible says, do not be squeezed into the world's mold. Okay? Be not transformed, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so it takes a, it takes a grown up faith to be able to go out in this world and keep your faith and stand for what you know is right and to call on the name of the Lord and to identify yourself with a bunch of uh, um, oh, we are antiquated and um, uneducated and uh, strange and crazy and where you name it this is Christian reputation in the world at large and it takes it takes a backbone and it takes a strong faith to hold on to your faith out in this world. So again, we've got to start as early as we can. If, it's, if they're not this short anymore, just, you know, start today. There's an old proverb that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant it is today. So whatever you got, wherever you are, you, we pick it back up and we go with it and say, Dear God Almighty, help me to do all that I can for the sake of my kids and my grandkids and any other kids that we care about and help to build that fundamental foundational faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so they know how to call on the name of the Lord. They know right from wrong. They know what the Bible says and they believe what the Bible says and they're going to stand for Jesus whether anybody likes it or not, whether they fit in or not, whether it's best for their career or not. Because this is going to shape the person that you are and the way that you live your life and the generation which is to come. I don't know about you, but I do not plan to live on this earth forever. I'm here today. I'm going to be gone soon. And God's going to replace me. Amen? It, it also, he, he, he better replace you too. Right? If we're going to be the salt of the earth and light of the world, if we're going to have church in this country, guess whose shoulders that responsibility will rest on? The Christian young people we have today. This is why they're so vitally important. Now we love our kids just because we love our kids. And they're no perfect kids, but they're no perfect churches either. But that's not the point. But this is why we do what we do. Now, let me tell you that I wish... I wish I could give you the guarantee. If you will do A, B, and C, if you'll do steps one through five, I promise you that your kids will grow up to be good, wonderful, strong Christian believers. Guaranteed. I wish I could guarantee you that. You know what? It don't work that way. It don't work that way. Well, what, what's a parent or grandparent to do? Well, we do what we always do. We do the best we can with what we've got at the time. But we work at it and we're diligent at it. And we don't let it go and we don't quit. We don't give up. Sadly, I think that the numbers are 
nationwide. The last I heard, 80% of young people from the church, when they go to college, they quit their faith. 80%. How is that possible? It's just a mean old world. It's an unbelieving world. And when you and, and when you take someone and put them in an environment where everybody's unbelieving, that's a, that is a 24-hour day onslaught against your faith. And you say, well, what's the point? Well, the point is we're talking about eternal souls here. We're talking about kids that we love. And we see it. We see it all the time, don't we? Kids from good families, church families, and they go off job or college or military, and they lose their mind. And it breaks my heart, and it breaks your heart too, to see so many kids destroy their lives before they're 22, 23 years old. Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, we can't give up. Amen? We can't give up. So what we do is we hold on to God's promise. God's promise says this. Stick that verse back up there, please. The one about the child. I want them to see that right there. This is a promise from God. <coughs> Train up a child in the way he should go. That's our part. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Remember the prodigal son? Remember that, remember that guy? He came from a good home and family too, didn't he? Got old enough to make his own decisions. Paul says, mine, acting like a heathen. One day he had his head in a slop bucket. And the Bible said he came to himself. He came to himself and said, what am I doing? Well, my dad's got servants, workers, who are better off than this. I'm going to go home and apologize. Amen. And he got up, got the slop out of his beard, and headed for home. If dad's sitting out on the, park, on, on the porch, rocking in that chair, thinking about his prodigal boy, and he looks up there, and here comes down the road, comes one, just one more starved to death bum. There's something different about this one. He recognizes scrawny and scraggly and not much left of him, but he recognizes the shape and he recognizes the walk. And he looks at that and he says, oh my goodness, this is my son. And so the, the, the father runs to the son and throws his arms around him. And you, you know, it's just a beautiful story. He says, father, father, I've done this. He says, don't talk about it. Come on, we're having a party. Put, a, put shoes on his feet. Put the family ring back on his finger. My son has come home. And it threw a great big party. The story of the prodigal son, we all have heard it a hundred times. Well, when we back up to the, to the point where, where he had his head in the slop bucket, we don't say, well, I, I, wish, I, wish, I wish my child would get a little bit better. I need, I need, a, I need a sign of, of uh, improvement. Uh, we're making progress. Because sometimes the more you pray for someone, the more hard-headed they get. Does that ever happen to you? That the more you the more you talk to, to God about them and the more you pour yourself into them, it seems like they just they, they push harder and they go further and further away. But you can run, but you can't hide. Because Almighty God still hears and answers the prayers of the people who have had responsibility over you. Your parents and your grandparents and your godly Christian teachers that you had in school and those folks down at church. Because God answers prayers that are based on love and caring and compassion and selfishness and all that character of Christ that we talked about. And so no matter how far a person may stray, as long as there's life, there's hope because the Holy Spirit knows right where you are. And we have planted good seed. Amen? I need to be able to know I need to be able to get on my knees and know and talk to God and know and answer to God and know that I did my part. 
I did my part as a parent. I did my part as grandparent. I did my part as Christian neighbor. I did my part as pastor. I did my part to plant good seed in that soil. So that sooner or later, it might not jump up like a bunch of squash. It might be more like an oak tree. It's going to take a minute. It's going to take some time. But sooner or later, this is our promise and this is our hope. This is what we hang on to with both hands and with our whole heart. God, this is your promise. You said, if I do my part, then you're going to do your part. When he is old, he'll not depart from it because we as Christians run through their spiritual veins. We have sowed the good seed of the word of God. We sent them out in an unbelieving world with a deep-seated faith and they will never, ever get over that. And God knows where they are and whether we see incremental improvements or not, one day there's going to be an epiphany and they're going to straighten up and they're going to want to get right with God. Whether all the, 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 the backlog gets straightened out, probably not because you know how life is and messy it can get. And we have put things in motion that cannot be stopped for the rest of our lives, but that's God's purview. The one thing that we need to know is that, dear God, this is a promise that you have given me from your word. I'm going to hang on to this to my dying day. This is my promise. And you just don't give up on folk. Amen? You don't give up. Because you don't know what was going on in someone's heart and life. Whether, it, whether it's one of our kids, or whether it's a, a church member, or whether it's our neighbor, or whether it's our country. God knows and he's still in control. So, so what, what do we do? How do we do these things? Well, what the Bible said. Two different things. It said we're going to we're going to model it. We're going to model it before our children. Put put that next one up there. Sis. Yeah. Alright, these words I command you shall be in your heart, Mom and Dad. Church member. And you shall you shall teach them diligently to your children. How? You're going to talk about them in your house. When you're walking, when you lay down, when you get up, you're going to talk about it. You're going to have it tattooed on your hand or, 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 or tied on there. It'd be like frontless between your eyes. It's like you wear a headband. Got the Word of God right there. It's not our culture, but whatever works, right? It's going to be on your bumper stickers. It's going to be on your t-shirts. It's going to be hanging on your wall. It's going to be, it's going to be a Bible in your house. You're going to pray over your food at home. You're going to have a godly Christian life. You're going to teach by modeling and showing how to our kids, our grandkids, and all our other kids. This is how you live a Christian life on a daily basis. This is how you do it. We model it. And the second thing is the saturation. I mean, these, these folks, they had to have the Word of God everywhere, didn't they? Everywhere you turn, there was, here's the Word of God. What are they going to talk about? Well, they're going to talk about, they going to talk about Godly stuff. All right? It's just everywhere. You can't get away from it. So when we come to church, guess what? It's everywhere. So for our kids, we're picking on the kids today because tomorrow's church again. For our kids, we have nursery and Sunday school and children's church and Wednesday night and church camp and whatever else we can come up with. We got a praise band that gets up here and they just go at it. It's a wonderful blessing. Okay, we're te trying to teach them not only to come to church but to be involved and help and lead what church is all about. We have our teenagers that 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 work there on a rotating schedule. They work in the nursery. They work in children's church. We're training them up. We're doing the best that we can. And we're trying to join forces again with the team of your family and your church together and with God Almighty. And that's how we do it. So we're going to send them to church camp tomorrow. We're going to pray. How many of you here are going to pray for our church campers? Every day. Every day. Amen. Every day they're gone. Till they get back. We're going to pray for our kids that they're going to meet Jesus. That their souls are going to be saved if they don't know him already. That their lives will be changed. We want them to have a mountaintop experience in the presence of God. There's something magical about church camp. You take them away from an unbelieving world. And you put them up there on top of that hill. And there's nothing around but Christians. And there's not all the stuff and nonsense that goes on in the world. And it is an environment that we build. And the presence of the Lord is there. And they're all the time worshiping. And all the time reading the Bible. And they're all the time getting close to God. And it finally quietens the noise of this world enough. That they can hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Deep in their heart and in their mind. That's how you get their lives changed. And their souls saved. That's why we send them to church camp. Amen.
that's what it's about. It's not like going to camp to learn how to shoot a bow and arrow or your practice on your, your, your shopping skills or whatever. This is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's what we do. And that's why we do it. Because we love you. Amen? We just love you, that's all. That's all. Heavenly Father, again, we just want to say thank you for your blessings. Well, thank you that you are a loving, kind, Heavenly Father, and that you raised us from the time that we were born again as your children. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Thank you for the power of prayer and of faith. Thank you, Lord, that we can share it with the next generations as they come up, dear Father. Give us strength. Give us patience, Lord. Give us courage. Give us an undying faith, Lord to share it with others. We love you. We thank and we praise you in Jesus' holy and mighty name.